the revolution is dying. With a series of military defeats and a failed invasion of Canada, the opportunity for independence was slipping. Bleak news would travel across the desk of Congress. A massive British and German army of 30,000 men were sailing over the Atlantic to put an end to the rebellion. The fate of the new nation rests in the hands of a few complicated men that would decide the fate of America. Welcome all to the second episode of the Secondary Sources Podcast. This week, we will be diving deep into the Saratoga Campaign. The Saratoga Campaign was a series of battles that decided the fate of the American Revolution. The British planned to take control of the strategically significant Hudson River by taking a series of forts and then Albany in upstate New York. And then they would sever New England from the rest of the American colonies, the center of the rebellion, as the British thought. Lieutenant General John Burgoyne was one of the creators of this ambitious divide and conquer strategy, and he was the one that led a force of 8,000 men from Quebec and down the Hudson River, where a series of military defeats in September and October forced him to surrender. Lieutenant John Burgoyne wanted three armies to march simultaneously and secure the Hudson, and then they would all link up forces and march on Philadelphia, the capital of the new nation. To get approval for this ambitious plan, Burgoyne returned to London in early 1777 to discuss his plan to end the war with Parliament and the King. Other generals were also in London at the time, pitching different strategies to end the war, also in a decisive, quick way, as the British government wanted. All plans had many, all the plans had many different assumptions and were conflicting in interest. British General William Howe had beaten Washington and drove him out of Long Island. This gave him seniority in the planning stages. Howe's plan was to decisively crush the Americans before a foreign power could intervene and save them. Howe believed that with his assist, with the assistance of German troops and British regulars, he could crush New England. But Howe lost his seniority after Washington crossed the Delaware, taking Howe's army completely off guard. This gave credibility to Burgoyne. The king, who had complete control of all armed forces, gave a verbal order for Burgoyne to proceed with his plan. While Howe got approval from a different department, from the commander-in-chief of the North American Department, to march on Philadelphia. These orders were conflicting, overly detailed, and set piece. They were planned an ocean away from the theater of war they were supposed to operate in. Both generals would then, you know, return to America and prepare their offensives, unaware of the mass confusion and the different plans till it was too late. The Americans had no idea about what the British plans were and where Burgoyne was planning to attack. Congress was convinced that Burgoyne was going to land in New York by sea and link up with Howe. Washington would secure, would send units upstate New York to secure his lanes just in case the react to wherever the British landed. While Congress would perpetually send more and more troops up north, and altogether 8,500 men were stationed up north near the border of Canada. Burgoyne started his expedition in mid-June with St. Leger's diversionary campaign also starting around that time. Their plan hit difficulties immediately, due to the fact that the first part of the expedition was going to be on water. There were very few wagons and horses and draft animals to move all this heavy equipment and artillery. This created massive delays in the expedition, and to supplement this, they had to make wagons themselves, which were poorly put together, delaying them even further. Burgoyne quickly got his men together and they moved down the river to capture the capture Fort Crown Point by June 30th. They used this as a staging area to attack the, impregna, the, the impregnable fortress of Fort Ticonderoga. Fort Ticonderoga was a massive four-star fortress that defended the Hudson, a little river north of the Hudson. The fort was taken early in the war by Bandit Arnold and Ethan Allen's militia. It was essential for the British to take it back and control the Hudson River. Ticonderoga was manned by a garrison of around 3,000 regulars and militia. After the fort was captured by the Americans, they spent time fortifying. They extended the fort's defenses and created massive redoubts. 
these there were two hills that surrounded the fort and overlooked the lake. Both were armed with redoubts and cannons. One hill was nicknamed Independence, and another was nicknamed Defiance. The commander of the fort, Brigadier General Alter St. Clair, had no idea of the strength of Burgoyne's of Burgoyne and the movements. And this was due to the effective screen of Native Americans that Burgoyne hired. General St. Clair knew they did not have enough manpower to defend the fort and both hills, and decided that if the enemy would attack, he would defend Hill Independence, because it was higher. Burgoyne believed that taking the Fort Ticonderoga would be a massive undertaking, and that it would require an enormous amount of resources. He believed that there would be a massive garrison guarding the fort and the surrounding hills. Burgoyne wanted to bring, and did bring, 12 pound or cannons to pound the fort in submission. He wanted his men to take the high ground around the fort so he could use his cannons to pound Fort Ticonderoga into submission and get a big garrison to surrender. The retaking the fort was not only a strategic imperative, but also a symbolic one. Britain was furious that they lost the fort in the first place, and fame would befall any general who retook it. On, in July, uh, in, around July 2nd, skirmishing began around the outer defenses. But by, by July 4th, the British were able to take Mount Defiance and prepared to bring up their cannons to the shell of the fort. The Americans quickly withdrew from the fort, deeming it a loss. St. Clair spit his, split his men and retreated in two different directions with the British hot on their tail. In the early hours of July 7th, a combined British and German force attacked an element of exhausted American troops who spent the previous day fast marching from Hill Independence. They marched 24 miles, and they were, they were burnt. The British planned a two-pronged attack where the British would attack from one side and the Hessians the other, and then their plan was to just rout the American militia, because this was mostly militia. And uh, when the attack began, it was successful with the groggy Americans being taken completely off guard. And this was while they were eating breakfast. So they fled towards the tree line while being heavily pursued by the British. American commanders could, could, uh, rallied their men, the uh, retreating militia, on top of this ridge and did an impressive holding it action against the British. The Americans while rallied, fired devastating volleys into the pursuing British at close quarter, annihilating their ranks. Hessians shortly arrived from one, the other direction uh, after the opening attack, causing the Americans to scatter into the forest. This was a foreshadow for things to come for the, America, for the, for the Americans. The militia were weaker units, but under the proper leadership and terrain, they were devastating. The British would perpetually struggle in fighting on rough terrain, and could not bring their devastating volleys to bear. Around this time, Burgoyne regrouped his men and divided them, then divided his forces. The infantry element would travel through the forest of Skisboro and then take Fort Annie, which was in the forest, while heavy artillery would travel by water through Lake George, and they would all link up simultaneously at Fort Edward. Burgoyne thought that the Americans would make a stand at Fort Annie and Fort Edward, but yet again, he would be mistaken. General St. Clair would briefly hold Fort Annie and would delay the British by burning bridges and cutting trees down, making the route to the fort impassable. On July 8th, the militia would attack an advance guard of British around 10 o'clock in the morning. The British would hold off the Americans for a couple hours till reinforcements arrived, causing the Americans to rout. St. Clair decided then to burn down Fort Annie, knowing he could not withstand a British assault, and made his way to Fort Edward. General Schuyler quickly rode north upon hearing news of the fall of Ticonderoga, and quickly organized a, uh, the mixed garrison of 700 regulars and 1,400 militia. Schuyler decided that he wanted to delay Burgoyne as much as possible and ordered his men to cut trees down, burn bridges, and redirect dams, as St. Clair did. Uh, this delayed Burgoyne's army for two weeks while his men were stuck clearing the forest. 
On July 24th, they reached Fort Edward and found it abandoned. The only positive thing that happened during those two weeks was that more Native Americans joined the British and were filling their ranks. Schuyler would keep the Langber going by using his scorch earth tactics, and this brought time for more Americans to march up north. North, <laughs> not north, north. <laughs> Burgoyne is criticized heavily for his decision to move his forces through the forest because uh, of the delaying actions that the Americans did. And some historians uh, agree or defend Burgoyne by his decision to travel through the forest by saying that the bring his army and the artillery through Lake George would have taken multiple trips and probably would have taken the same amount of time to get everything to Fort Edward. So around this time, St. Leger uh, does his diversionary expedition that was also part of Burgoyne's strategy. The expedition quickly sailed across Lake Ontario and arrived in Oswego. So, and this force was about 300 leg regulars, 650 Canadians slash loyalist militia, along with 1,000 Native Americans. On August 2nd, they began sieging Fort Sandwich on the Mohawk River. 800 members of the Troy County Militia attempted to relieve the siege, but were ambushed at the Battle of Orensky. Uh, the militia held off the ambush and fought in close quarters, and then... Uh, uh, so they fought in these close quarters battles. And the thing that the militia did was when they were ambushed, they retreated behind cover. And the thing they did was when the natives attacked them, uh, they would have one man, they would have men hide behind, like, let's say like a log or like a tree, but it'd be in groups of two. So one man would fire while the other reloaded. So someone was always shooting relatively. And... The militia held back the assault this way, and this is because they were on favorable terrain. But during this fighting, the uh, the Troy County militia fell back because they uh, their general was morally wounded. On August 10th, Benedict Arnold moves his forces up north to relieve the siege fort with 800 regulars and hopes to gather a force from the Troy County Militia, but once he got there, only 100 men decided to join him. St. Leger spent most of the siege trying to convince the small garrison to surrender because he didn't have enough men to take the fort. St. Leger's men were dwindling fast, with the Native Americans de deserting or had been killed in the previous battle. And this left St. Leger in a really terrible situation. He only had 300 regulars which were and unreliable militia left. Arnold believed through stories of the Troy County militia that they had a much larger force and he requested reinforcements to be sent to him. Arnold was denied these reinforcements, so he decided to switch to subterfuge. Arnold sent a fake loyalist into St. Leger's camp and convinced the men that Arnold was arriving with a massive relief force. This caused the militia and remnants of the May Americans to demand a withdraw. St. Leger felt he had no choice and left, retreating back to Fort Ticonderoga. Saratoga is viewed today as one decisive battle, but it was actually a multitude of field maneuvers over the course of two battles. And around this point, Burgoyne's army had shrunk down to around 7,000 men. Burgoyne had to make a choice. The window for victory was shrinking. Burgoyne decided to make a controversial decision after he found out that the British army he was supposed to link up with didn't get the orders and they weren't coming, and it was just mass confusion. So Burgoyne decided to consolidate his forces and cut off his supply lines, consol consolidate his army, and commit his plan to marching to Albany. The Continental Congress uh, assigned Horatio Gates to be the new commander of the War Department. Gates would pass over General Schuyler because Congress became frustrated with his delaying tactics and his scorched earth tactics and wanted a set-piece devastating battle. Congress believed that Gates would be given, given, if he was given the opportunity, would crush the enemy. And Gates was an experienced leader, spent most of his life in the British Army, but and he was really a a solid general but gates was also cold arrogant and had a massive massive ego 
Gates arrived at Albany on August 19th and immediately took charge from General Schuyler. Gates excluded Schuyler from council meetings and plannings for the battle. This was Gates' cold way of saying that you've done your job, but it's my show now and you're useless to me. So Schuyler, furious, packed his things and left camp to join General Washington. This was an egotistical move on Gates' part. Schuyler had done an excellent job in delaying Burgoyne's advance and led the American army to this decisive point. A mix of militia and regulars started flooding uh, to Gates, swelling their ranks to over 8,000 men. Gates now slightly outnumbered Burgoyne, but Gates' army was mostly made up of militia. Militia could not match the disciplined skill of the British riflemen, who had proven repeatedly that they could fight effectively while outnumbered. Gates believed that the militia would perform better behind earthworks, and set out to find a hill literally to die on. A Polish, a Polish engineer found a nice defensive line 10 miles south of Saratoga named the Bimis Heights. The Polish engineer quickly went about setting up redoubts and fortifications. Gates wanted to avoid a pitch battle at all costs unless he had large numerical, numerical superiority, leaving nothing to chance. Gates would have trouble gathering intelligence due to the small amount of cavalry that he would have, and he would frequently use light infantry to assist him in his scouting roles. Burgoyne had his back against the wall. He was outnumbered, with winter closely setting in. He had two options left. A. Retreat back to Ticonderoga. Or B. Fight through Gates. Retreating back to Ticonderoga would essentially be a death march, with him losing... The remainder of his force to exhaustion or to Gates' army that would definitely be aggressively pursuing. Even if by some miracle Burgoyne did make it back to Ticonderoga before winter, uh, there would not be enough food for his army. So, fighting through Gates seemed like the best option. Burgoyne's regulars on open field could, in theory, crush the militiamen. The left flank of the American line seemed like the best place to attack, and there Burgoyne would attack in force, while working parties would build bridges and repair roads for heavy artillery to support this battle. Benedict Arnold had recently arrived, and he knew that there was going to be attack on the left, tank, the left flank, and he believed that the rough terrain near the left flank would make excellent opportunity for the Americans to harass and delay with light infantry and militia. Arnold got approval from Gates to deploy light infantry in the wooded areas around the left flank, and on December 19th, the Battle of Freeman's Farm began, with Morgan's rifles skirmishing to devastating effect with other light infantry units. When the British attacked on force on the left flank, they skirmished with the riflemen for a brief time, and then the British retreated from the forest and formed up on flatter ground. And the undisciplined Morgan's rifles pursued the British, and they were annihilated under perpetual volley fire under the British. So Morgan's rifles had to rout. Gates decided that this would be an excellent battle, actually, and committed more forces to Morgan, who was regrouping at the time. The Americans formed a crest around the southwest side of Freeman's farm, where an aggressive back and forth developed when the Americans started turning the British left and temporary capturing, temporarily capturing British cannons. Each side would break off for a little bit, reform, counterattack, and retreat. And uh, by late afternoon, the Americans had 2,200 men committed against Burgoyne, who now was substantially outnumbered. Sharpshooters picked off many officers throughout the battle, creating disorder through the ranks. The sharpshooters would usually hide in trees and in brush and wait for smoke or lulls in the fighting to fire. Burgoyne's men struggled to counter these snipers, and the only thing that really could were the Hessian skirmishers, but they were too little of them to make a difference. Burgoyne's men had been fighting for almost four hours consecutively and were on the verge of breaking, so Burgoyne committed General von Rizzel his Hessian commander, against the American right flank. The Hessians uh, were first, uh, their original orders were to explore the gap made at Bemis Heights and were on 
the completely other side of the battlefield when the fighting for Freeman's farm started. The Hessians arrived at the fighting late in the day, waiting, uh, and they were slowly marching to the field because they wanted uh, the uh, Hessians wanted his men fresh for the battle. And they stopped twice throughout the day for breaks. And when they showed up, they were they took the Americans completely off guard and smashed into the right flank. The Americans did a fighting withdrawal and left the field. And the British had won a tactical victory, while the Americans have won an, an important strategic victory. Burgoyne's army was badly bloodied and retreated back to camp. After the battle, Burgoyne got hopeful news from General Clinton in New York that he was going to send an army to Burgoyne. Now, this gave Burgoyne false hope that help was coming. Burgoyne held the field after Freeman's farm, and which gave him a massive tactical advantage. News that reinforcements might actually came come gave Burgoyne hope that he could still win. Instead of renewing the battle the next day, Burgoyne decided to fortify and wait for reinforcements. He created these massive redoubts that stretched over ravines and rivers, and this made sure the Americans would have to cross flat field to attack him while his experienced riflemen hid safely behind redoubts. Burgoyne erected a couple redoubts. One was built kind of on the farmhouse of Freeman's farm, nicknamed the Light Infantry Redoubt, which was massive. And then there was another to the right called Brayman's Redoubt. Bimez height, uh, Bimez, sorry, I slurred my words. Anyway, the, the Americans were doubt. The Americans also redacted, um, also kept fortifying too, while reinforcements kept flooding into the attack. And, um, yeah, it was just the, the British waited. They delayed and they just waited for help that would never come. Um, during uh, this break in the fighting, more reinforcements would perpetually flood into Gates' camp. Gates now was gr now grossly outnumbered Burgoyne. But a different issue developed on the American redoubts. General ben Benedict Arnold would start fighting with Gates. Gates and Arnold, for the first two years, for the first part of the war, had gotten along. But Arnold was at a breaking point. Both generals had massive personalities, and Arnold felt passed over. During the Battle of Freeman's Farm, Gates denied Arnold reinforcements to end the battle decisively. That's number one. Number two, Arnold was second in command to Schuyler, but when Gates took command, he was demoted to third, which infuriated him. And the last and most crushing blow was that Gates left Arnold out of the report to Congress, not giving him credit for his planning at Freeman's farm. Throughout the buildup, Arnold would be openly hostile and insubordinate to a point where Gates took Arnold's command away. Arnold was furious. His career was basically over. He was, un he was um, openly hostile to a superior officer. And his insubordination would basically end his career. No one would want to work with someone like that. On October 7th, Burgoyne made one last attempt on taking the left flank and decided to send around 1,000 men in a reconnaissance in force. Burgoyne was running low on food and gave his men the last of his rations and ordered them to probe the left-hand side of the heights. If the left wing looked weak, he would commit a massive force to reinforce the probe. This battle seemed desperate, and it was. Burgoyne was starting to believe that nothing was going to save him, and that Clinton wasn't going to come. When the British launched their attack, Gates committed in kind. Arnold was still in the camp, but he had no command, no responsibility. He was just there. Uh, just like just lost and he suggested that they commit a bunch of reinforcements and end the battle decisively and gates replied coldly you have no business here arnold would 
be furious and return to his tent and start drinking to suppress his rage and not being with his men at the battle. The Americans would stop the British assault and force the British to retreat back to the redoubts. The Americans aggressively pursued the British to the redoubts and Arnold, in a drunken in a drunken rage, jumped on a horse and joined the battle. The Americans would attempt to storm the light infantry redoubt, but were constantly repulsed. Arnold would twice attack Bermay's redoubt, and uh, after the first attempt was repulsed, Arnold led his men in between the redoubts. Yeah, Bremen's redoubt. I said it French, like, I don't know, that was weird. And he would lead his men in between the redoubts, and Arnold would then charge some light infantry, and they would break the light infantry and then attack Bremen's redoubt in the rear. During the fighting, Arnold's horse was shot out from under him and shattering his leg. Nightfall ended the battle with Burgoyne's force completely broken, with all munitions used up. After the battle, Burgoyne attempted to withdraw, but was outmaneuvered and surrounded. His men had four days of rations left and were low on munitions. Burgoyne decided to negotiate terms with Gates, knowing he was done. The terms agreed were that the men would return to Europe on parole. There was a brief ceremony where Gates gave credit to a couple generals and purposely left Arnold out. The Saratoga campaign ended with a total failure for the British and a complete victory for the Americans. Once news of the American victory traveled across the ocean, France and Spain desperately wanted to join the war in fear that the British would come to the peace table with the Americans. This completely changed the revolution in size and scope, turning independence into a reality. Gates will go down in history as a flawed man who, you know, passed, who, who got credit for a battle that some think he didn't win, and for the fighting with Benedict Arnold, while Burgoyne would travel back to London and defend his campaign mistakes and decisions. And the Saratoga campaign was the moment where the American Revolution could be won. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening, guys, and, uh, I'll see you in the next one.